structural analysis skills really don't help us much if we can't take the reality of the problem, loads and real members, and turn them into an idealized structure and turn them into idealized loads that we can then apply equations of equilibrium and the principles of structural analysis to. So the focus of this problem is how do we make that conversion? How do we convert distributed load into line and point loads acting on an idealized supporting structure? And the key concepts we're going to work with are converting the distributed surface loads into resultant line loads and converting those line loads on a member into point loads on supporting members. So here's the problem we're going to work with. We have a roof deck consisting of precast lightweight concrete, three inch thick panels. And those panels rest on the flanges of T-bars, we'll call those the subperlins, and they're spaced two and a half feet on centers. Those subperlins are clipped to the tops of the main purlins, and those main purlins are spaced six feet apart. So member CD is a main purlin, member AB is one of the subperlins. We want to determine the distributed loading that this deck, these concrete panels, exert on the subperlin AB, and we want to figure out the concentrated loading on the main purlin CD located along the edge of the deck. Let's begin with a sense of the answer. What is the total load we should expect to ultimately act on the purlin CD? To calculate the total load, we need to know the self-weight of the concrete panels, and we can find that information in Table 1-3. From this table, we see that lightweight concrete is among the floor fill options, and the weight is 8 pounds per square foot per inch of thickness of the concrete. Now since each panel is three inches thick, we multiply that by the eight pounds per square foot per inch. We get 24 pounds per square foot equivalent distributed surface load. So our goal initially is to find the total load on Perlin CD. So we'll have something to check against at the end. Well, we know that the pressure, surface pressure of the concrete is 24 pounds per foot squared. The total area of the floor is 6 feet by 10 feet, 60 feet squared. Now, where does all that load go? If we assume that the load travels to the nearest supporting purlin, then half of the total weight of the concrete panels goes to purlin CD. So the total force on purlin CD going to be one half of the floor area times the distributed pressure on that floor. And that gives us 720 pounds total load on CD. Now let's look more closely at how load flows through the system. We have the concrete panel and on one edge supported by a T-bar, call it a subperlin. On the other edge there's another T-bar or another subperlin. Now because the edges of the concrete panels can rotate in between we can idealize the situation as such. Since that panel is only supported on two edges, that 
floor system will act one way toward the subperlins. And so our tributary width for purlin AB is half of the panel weight goes, for half of the panel from the left side goes to AB. Half of the panel from the right side goes to AB for a total tributary width of 2.5 feet. Since the panels have an equivalent distributed surface load of 24 pounds per square feet and a tributary width of 2.5 feet, the resultant line load acting on the purlin, or subperlin rather, AB, is 24 pounds per square foot times the 2.5 foot width, 60 pounds per linear foot. So let's sketch purlin A or subperlin AB. We have a uniform distributed load because the tributary width and distributed surface load are constant along that subperlin. So we have a distributed load of 60 pounds per linear foot on AB. Now to find the effects on the purlin CD, we need to know what forces are coming from the subperlin AB and the other subperlins that are similar to it. Now since the subperlins AB are clipped to the purlins, we're going to get only vertical reactions at the ends of the member. So now we'll apply equilibrium to find each of these vertical reactions because we need a Y. So if I sum moments about end B, and I'll take counterclockwise as positive, we know that equilibrium says that has to be zero. And so I have a minus AY through six feet plus 60 pounds per linear foot times a 6 feet converts it to a force and the resultant force acts halfway across the member. If I solve for AY I get 180 pounds. That quantity is positive. We assumed it was up. Now we're ready to figure out the forces acting on Perlin CD. Well, we know that there's going to be a force acting on it from subperlin AB. Newton's third law says that if the reaction AY holding up subperlin AB is 180 pounds, then the force acting on, on Perlin CD is going to be 180 pounds down. And actually, all of those interior subperlins will have the same force acting down. But what about the force acting at C? There, the subperlin has half as much concrete panel to carry. So the force acting on the member will be half as big, and that'll be only 90 pounds. So if we take a look at member CD, we have a point force acting on each end and acting interior where each of the subperlins act, uh, sits, rests. Each of the exterior ones adds 90 pounds. Each of the interior ones add 180 pounds. 
Now let's check to make sure this is okay. Our sum of the forces in the Y are 90 pounds, and there's two of those. 180 pounds, and there's three of those. Put it all together, 720 pounds, which equals what we approximated or assumed at the very beginning. So that's a good sign that we've tracked our numbers just fine. So here are the sketches of our idealized members. Subperlin AB had a uniform distributed load of 60 pounds per linear foot, and subperlin CD, oops, there's the C, there's the D, has concentrated forces acting on it, 90 pounds, 180 pounds, 180 pounds, 180 pounds, and 90 pounds. Now let's review what it took for us to get here. Our original goal was to convert the distributed load, the self-weight of the concrete panels, into idealized loads acting on the idealized member AB and the idealized loads acting on member CD. We started by saying let's get an idea of the total force acting on member CD as a check at the end and so we got the weight of the concrete using help from table 1-3 we found that the concrete panels are 24 pounds per square foot. Combine that with the total area of the floor. Assumed that half the floor load would go to each of the purlins, purlin being member CD and the other one just like it on the other side. And so we expect 720 pounds total load applied onto member CD. We then looked at how much of the floor panel weight went to each subperlin, for example, member AB, found that it's a one-way action, and therefore we looked at the tributary width coming to subperlin AB as being constant, which means that our distributed load on member AB is uniform. We then found the reactions holding up member AB and looked at Newton's third law which says those reactions that hold up member AB act on member CD. We notice that the subperlins on the end over at D and at C carry half as much concrete as the interior ones so we adjusted the forces accordingly and then we added up all those forces just to check and it does match what we originally had estimated. Then we consolidated the sketches of the two members and we're all done.